Welcome to Two Quants and a Financial Planner, where we bridge the worlds of investing and financial planning to help investors achieve their long-term goals. Join Matt Ziegler, Jack Forehand, and me, Justin Carbonell, as we cover a wide range of investing and planning topics that impact all of us and discuss how we can apply them in the real world to achieve the best outcomes in our financial lives. Justin Carbonell and Jack Forehand are principals at Validia Capital Management. Matt Ziegler is Managing Director at Sunpoint Investments. The opinions expressed in this podcast do not necessarily reflect the opinions of Validia Capital or Sunpoint Investments. No information on this podcast should be construed as investment advice. Securities discussed in the podcast may be holdings of clients of Validia Capital or Sunpoint Investments. All right, guys. I think that today's conversation is a good time to have the conversation we're going to have, given how stocks have performed and a lot of investment strategies perform coming off of what, you know, is, is a very, very strong, uh, 2023. And, um, the, the gist of our conversation is, 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 you know, lessons that can be learned. I think from looking at, it's really the rise and fall of any mutual funds or investment strategies that really blow up and get big. Um, and we're not, trying to pick on ARC here, but, you know, ARC, Kathy Woods firm, um, and, the, and their flagship ETF, the ARC Innovation ETF, you know, was sort of like the, the poster child for, you know, disruptive investing and the type of investing that had a really, really great run, um, up until, you know, the end of, um, 20, well, mid, mid 2021, I would say. Uh, when the Fed started raking race and we went into the bear market in 2022 and then all things kind of fell apart. And so I think what we wanted to do today is just sort of talk a little bit about the history of that fund, that firm. I think there's a lot of successes that can be pointed to, but there's certainly some not, whether you call them failures or just important lessons that investors can sort of learn from from this fund and, and really any strategy that goes through the type of things that we're going to talk about and sees this type of level of success. So maybe to start, let's just kind of all go around the table and kind of share, I guess, what we remember, at least in the beginning years with Kathy Wood and Ark. I can, you know, from my personal experience, we talked about this on the podcast a lot, uh, maybe on excess returns a little bit more, but is we launched our ETS, which was a fundamentally based small cap value ETF right around the same time that Kathy Wood launched ARC. And um, after five years of running our ETF, you know, we made the strategic decision to shut it down. Um, and I always kind of looked at Kathy, and given the type of investing she was doing and sort of asking myself, like, is this, you know, we're going to blow, our strategy is going to blow the doors off this strategy that's buying the most expensive, non-profitable, the disruptive stocks. Because, I mean, Jack and I, I think you too, Matt, may have been, you know, investing during the dot-com boom and bust. And I can only think back to that period of time and draw, drawing parallels to that. But anyways, the, you know, that's sort of at least at the beginning of, of ARC and Kathy running the strategy. You know, here we were running another strategy that was all based on fundamentals. And, um, you know, look at where we are. We have no ETF. Kathy has multiple ETFs and still manages $9 billion. So that says something about what she was able to do. But I don't know. What do you guys kind of remember from your early years of, of, of Folly Arc? Yeah, if this, if this has been about our ETF, it wouldn't be like the rise and fall of ARC. It would be like the fall and then additional fall of our, of our small cap value ETF. Um, so yeah, there's, there's probably some jealousy in this. You know, even though there's some lessons to learn from this, there's probably some jealousy from us that we launched a small cap value fund on the same day. Or it was like, it was almost the same day, wasn't it, Justin? It was really close. It was right around there. I've always thought it was like the same week, but as I've looked back at that, I think there may have been like a month or two in there. Okay. But yeah, we, we basically launched a small cap value fund at the exact wrong time and she launched an innovation fund at the exact right time. So, uh, but yeah, my, my one observation is, you know, like what you said at the beginning is this could be the rise and fall of the CGM focus fund this episode. It could be the rise and fall of the Fairhome fund. Like there's been so many funds that are the exact same thing. What was it? The Janus 20 or whatever, Matt, like back in the day, like, there's been so many funds that are the exact same thing, like contra- really concentrated portfolios, exceptional performance, people pile in money, it goes down, everybody pulls the money. Like it's, it's the same story over and over again. So it's not, you know, we're not picking on ARC here. Like there's, there's so many behavioral lessons in this type of stuff because it happens over and over again, you know, over different periods of time. I think, so Kathy Wood first, I think came on my radar because of, I had heard about her, but then the Invest Like the Best interview from 2018 or 2019. Do you remember this? Or did you oh, I do remember that. this when it came out. That was like the first time I ever like really paid her serious attention and, and had heard about the asset raising and whatever else she had going on at the time. But it's one of those, 
like you said, with the Janus Growth Fund and some of the other things. You're in this industry long enough. You see some of this stuff come and go. You know, I love to say you can't talk about markets without talking about marketing. And just like you have the doomers on one side, you have the, you know, acceleration, growth, whatever people on the other side. And I remember my first impression of her was like, she's a very compelling storyteller. And I think we're going to talk about this today, but this is the glue that holds the whole thing together. This is a smart, intelligent person, right or wrong. She's definitely felt the druthers of the market up until very recently again, but she's very convincing in the way she has a very specific framing about the world. And the hard part about betting on anything, but especially betting on like growth in a lower probability sense is, man, if you get it right, you look like a genius. If you get it wrong, everybody wants to drag you through the mud, but I don't know. There's that role that betting on this stuff plays too. And I'm always going to be a little bit envious of that. Yeah, I, that is the one thing. I think that a lot of the uh, people that were investing in the fund, and by the way, we, and we'll maybe throw a chart in this, like a lot of the money piled in, you know, after the great returns, it wasn't like investors were, a lot of investors were in there in 2015, 2016. I mean, her, the returns were, were decent. Um, and then I, uh, and then in 2017, I think the returns were sort of really, really strong, but it wasn't until after that, that sort of investors really started piling in. Um, but I think the storytelling, the narrative, her ability to articulate that, it sort of drove this cult-like following to some extent of those investors in ARC that were really believed in sort of this disruptive style of investing. And by the way, you know, a lot of great companies are in those funds and a lot of great companies will come out of those. It's just, you know, there was a lot of stuff in there too that just wasn't going to make it or that was unprofitable or, or business models just weren't there. And then, you know, when the air comes out of that bubble, like we saw in 2022, it's like, you better be ready because that's when these things can take a major hit. Take me back. What was the year she actually launched ARK Invest? When did this all officially start? 2014, I believe, Justin, is that right? I think, I think, yeah, our, the firm, I believe, start right or maybe 2013, 2014, something around that time period. She was a tech analyst before, but you know, I think with her founding of ARC, that's when it yeah, started. And am I correct that from the beginning, it was like, it was already primarily public markets investment disruption? So Yes, I believe so. Like, yes. Mm -hmm. Like, so this also like heralds in or it feels like it heralds in at least in part, like a new, a new wave of the public markets version of what everybody was getting jazzed up about with like venture and angel at the time too. Is that a yes. fair historical memory of what actually happened? Yeah, I think so. I think so. Yeah. I think you had a lot of, right. I mean, a lot of these, you know, there's been two, there's maybe two sides to that. On the one hand, they say there's a lot of companies that are in venture that are staying private longer. But I think during that, period, maybe you had companies that maybe weren't as mature coming public because the market appetite was there for that. And they were like in this disruptive category, you know, whenever that was at the time, whether it was software as a service or I don't know, whatever those disruptive categories are. Yeah. I think it's interesting that the, the market landscape and environment for when she appeared also shouldn't be overlooked in this. And that's, public markets doing what we generally expect a lot of high risk, uh, private markets to do. And like doing that in a way that brought more attention to investing in growth in a flavor and a variety in this type of package and structure that not too many people had seen. And that's probably a big part of why, because can you walk us through, do you have like the asset levels from 2014 when it started to like the ballooning with the returns? Cause I think this is another for allocators. This is a huge part of how we look at managers is understanding Yes. flows and what they can Let do. And then what they it's interesting that like how much, as much as those of us in the business don't want to admit it, like when you launch investment products, timing is such a huge part of that. Like think about the ARC Innovation ETF launched in 2021. Think about what that would look like. Like there would be no ARC. The company would probably be gone because the, they would have launched right into 80% drawdown. So it's like, it's like, like launching like, a small cap value ETF, right? In 2014. Yeah, or in 2014, like we did, like basically, and then that's not, that's in some ways me making an excuse for the fact that we, we got the wrong side of that. So I'm sure I'm bitter about that, but it is true. I mean, because investors are going to judge you 
on your short-term performance. Like the big variable when you launch an ETF like that is your short-term performance and you can't control it. You don't have any way, you know, there's no reliable way to predict what's going to happen in a one-year period in the market. So when anyone launches an ETF, now obviously if you're launching like a, a fixed income ETF or something, there's not as much variability around that. So you don't have to worry about that as much. But when you're launching a focused ETF, like we did on the small cap value side and like she did here, like a huge part of this is, are you lucky and do you get the big returns right away? If you get the big returns right away, you do a lot better. Now she had the other thing that we did not have too, which is she had a great storyteller and a great story. Like, you know, me sitting up there talking about small cap value and the steel companies we owned or whatever is probably not going to be as compelling as, you know, someone talking about 50% GDP growth or whatever she was talking about. So, you know, to some extent, like we didn't have that part, but she got it both together, which is where you get the big explosion. She had the story right and she had the performance right. And she put them together and that's where you get billions and billions of dollars. And what about, before he tells us flows, active ETFs? Because I also feel like ARK was right at the front end of this whole like active ETF movement. Is that fair to say too? I think so. You know, active ETFs is tough to talk about because it's really a distinction that doesn't matter. Right. Um, especially yeah. now, like you can run like, so for instance, our ETF was both an active and a passive ETF at different times. And I think we went back and forth twice. And in all cases, there was no change to the investment strategy. So basically you can run the exact same investment strategy as an index ETF as you can with an active. But I think you're right in terms of the way we would think about active. I think that's right. Like there were a lot of ETFs coming on board then that were running focused strategies that were running things that you would be that would be considered active, you know, by a lot of people. So I, I think she got that right as well. Yeah, I mean, she picked a great rapper. I mean, so she was, you know, you know, seeding an ETF in 2014. That's not necessarily, you know, there was still plenty of firms that were launching mutual funds then. So, you know, in terms of the rapper, that was great. But, you know, yeah, so for flows, it's, it's kind of mind blowing. So you can get this on Morningstar, but you have to go under the parent. So we're talking about, you know, ARK Investments as a firm, not necessarily the, the ARK Innovation ETS. But um, so 2017, from a performance perspective, ARC ETF returned 87%. So in 2018, in terms of flows, that was the first year that the total net flows crossed a billion dollars. So before 2018, the flows were less than a billion in the first three years, like maybe 10 to 20 million, something like that. And then after that great run in 2017, you know, flows ticked up to 1.4 billion. Um, and then you had, 2019. So in 2020, which was the performance of our, the ETS was up 100, 152% that year. And that's when you saw the total net flows come in at 20 billion plus. Um, and at that point, the total net assets of the firm were somewhere around like 34 billion. So you know, you had after that fantastic year, during that year, you had massive inflows coming in. And then if you look at, you know, subsequent performance in 2021, the ARC ETF was down 23%. And then in 2022, it was down 67%. Um, and the total, the max drawdown, by the way, I use portfolio visualizer for this, which is cool. You can stick in you know, any ETF or any stock and you can see all these return and, and you know, statistics and, and drawdown statistics, uh, statistics and stuff. But yeah, so the max drawdown, which was February 2021 to December 2022. So think about it. It was right after the year all those assets came in, you know, the drawdown was 17% on, on the ARK Innovation. And it's not her fault. I mean, if you think about it, like she, she didn't make the assets come in and out. Like she, she ran the fund and, and the, the assets came in and out. And it, it's, it's always a challenge for any asset manager. And this, this happens to a smaller degree in stuff like we run, like focus small cap value. Like people chase focus small cap value when it's doing well. They pull their assets when it's doing poorly. And it's a balance you always face as an investment manager is what do I do about that? Like on one hand, you can say, just run my focus, focus small cap value and try to get the right investors who aren't going to bail. On the other hand, you can say, well, people are going to bail. So let's dumb down the strategy so that, you know, it has better investor returns. So ARC, obviously, and we don't have the exact numbers, but ARC is going to have atrocious investor returns because all the money was pouring in at the top. And, the, you know, basically, and then the assets when they started losing money were much, much higher than the assets when they made money. So the returns are going to be terrible, but you can't completely blame her for that. 
I mean, she's stuck to and run a disciplined strategy the entire time. It's just investors have behaved crazy around that. I think that point's really important that the process, and again, this is where it's, I respect her for this aspect of it. Like she's stuck to that process. She's playing in a space that doesn't exist yet that we can't define in like the category she's investing in. And whether or not you agree with it, like she's stuck to her knitting around these things and she's suffered for being wrong and she's been rewarded for being right. But that's kind of what markets are for. And the other thing she's done a good job of is she has built conviction in her investors. So if you look at those inflows relative, there are outflows now, but if you look at the inflows relative to the outflows, like she's done as good a job as I've ever seen of like maintaining an investor base with those kind of returns. Like anything else you see that has 80, 90% drawdowns, like the, the flows are just headed out the door. Like she's done a really good job of building conviction in her investors and people have stuck with her. You know, so that, that I think is partially the, because of her, because she has a good following. And the other thing I think is part of that, and you, you probably know this, Matt, is like an allocator is I think more and more people these days are running like sort of the core and satellite approach. So people aren't like going all in on ARC. They're having like their core equity exposure and they're using funds like ARC as like a satellite to that. And when it's a smaller portion of your portfolio, I think you could do probably a better job of not bailing on it when it's doing poorly. I agree with that completely. And we see that a lot. Or people have a request that they want to do a one-off thing. So you have your core approach. And then it's just, how are you weighting the satellite? The interesting thing that a vehicle like ARC allows for is at least we can say, if you're going to do this super high growth, super high risk strategy, it helps you a lot in position sizing. And it helps you a lot to have at least a manager where it's like, this is how their convictions are channeled. Not saying it's as quantitatively pure as something maybe you guys are doing, but it is something where it's like, okay, we can, we can understand how to size this if this is a view somebody wants to, uh, put on and stick with. <laughs> but again, that's what she's been really, really good at. She's got that investor base really well coordinated around those ideas. The fact that we haven't seen massive, massive outflows and the destruction of this thing is a testament to the marketing capabilities of the firm. And, and by the way, just so everyone can know that we're fair and balanced, I mean, last year, our the ETS was up 60%. So to your point, Jack, sure. If investors wrote it all the way down in 2022 and were presented with, okay, what do I do with this money today? Do I just throw it to the S&P 500 and do I keep it in ARC? Clearly the better decision for them was to just keep it in ARC. Now, I think hopefully the lesson, we'll talk about a lot of lessons we think we can draw from this, but you know, for those investors, the lesson is, wow, this is a very volatile fund. This thing can be up or down, crazy. You know, maybe I shouldn't have maybe as big of an allocation or something like that. I mean, everyone can draw their own conclusions from it. But I just think, you know, it's, it's you know, she re they, the fund rebounded, you know, quite significantly last year. And so it's not all about just focusing on the drawdowns. Um, and those investors that kind of stuck with her, at least were rewarded relative to a lot of the other things invested in. I do have, before we move on to lessons, I, I kind of want to make one point here and it, I don't know what you guys think of this. Like, I, I do think because we've been investing in these different technological innovation cycles, you know, there is, and this is a more, this is kind of like putting on a speculative hat, but I'm just kind of wondering from an investing standpoint, what you guys think of this. There certainly is when you have these big boosts of, and you can think about this with AI a little bit. And maybe we'll get into this because I think there's some quotes from a guy that we had on that we want to reference. But, you know, there are times when early on, and it maybe can last for longer than we think, like there are great money making opportunities in these hot growth areas of the market that investors are just super excited about. And when they come, it's like recognizing that and being able to take advantage of that as an investor um can be great and like i'm thinking like one way that you could do that is like utilize momentum for example as a factor like what areas exhibiting the strongest momentum you kind of go there with a piece of your portfolio and if it coincides with this like technical like revolution or some game-changing technology or game-changing business models you know at least in my experience there's been you and you gotta get the timing right of course and that's the difficult part because kathy would have the timing really correct for some of the time and then obviously when things kind of fell apart really bad, 
during the period, it was good. It was really good. And there's been other periods in the market in history where it's been great to be investing in those areas. It's just, I guess, a challenging person. I don't know what you guys sort of think of that. The, the interesting part about it is like these, these, these bubbles all are innovation cycles or whatever you want to call them. They always follow the same path. And, you know, you could talk about like the ones we're seeing now are much more like technology driven and, you know, advanced AI and stuff. But like, if you go back in history, you know, Shaughnessy did a really good paper on this. Like the path of these things is always the same. Um, you know, they're very, I mean, we can tell right now, AI is going to be a massive thing. Huge amounts of money are going to be made in AI, period. Like we know that for a fact. What we don't know is how to, how to take advantage of that sitting where we sit today. Because we know the companies that are going to be those companies that are going to generate most of the value, like nobody really knows what they are. And so it makes it very hard. It makes it easy to predict you're going to have like how the innovation cycle is going to play out is, is fairly easy to predict. But how you can make money on it is almost impossible to predict. And, and that's, that's common throughout all of these in history. And by the way, the only other point I'd make, which is interesting, and, and it's sort of counter to my value nature, is like the fact that tons of money pulls, pours into these things and you get a bubble is actually a really, really positive thing for the world in a lot of cases. And the reason is because you, you speed up the innovation. So although there'll be tons of money lost and stuff, the fact that tons of money went into the internet made the internet like a bigger innovation. It made, it made things better as a whole. The problem is there was a lot of money that was lost beneath the surface of people thinking, well, because this is going to be a huge thing as a whole, I can figure out what to invest in, you know, on the individual things underneath that hole. That, that's where the challenge is. But like bubbles actually can be very healthy for the actual innovation that, that the, has caused the bubble because it tons, creates tons of money into the innovation and it allows it to advance more quickly. The gas on the fire argument. <laughs> and, and it's real. But that's, again, that's part of the marketing of the story. Like I could sit here right now and say blockchain, genome, robotics, artificial intelligence, and energy storage, I think are the five big themes she has right now. And all those are very excitable. And we could call up 10 clients or 10 strangers on the street right now and get them fired up about any of those ideas. But like which companies are going to get it right and which are going to be the winning investments and which one have had the for future pulled into their current prices and valuations and whatever else, and which ones are still yet to realize it. And one of the biggest questions of them all, like, like what Microsoft is the last, like, great. I don't think she's a holder, but that's like the great big, like outlier of like tech bubble stock companies that like, as like, like Microsoft. And then I think Amazon is close behind is like companies who have compounded at absolutely like astounding rates over the last, that have been around since the tech boom, since the tech bubble. And it's really interesting to think about like with Fang and with this other stuff too. It's like, this is how hard this is to predict. We have exciting things. We have capital rushing into these ideas. We have all this stuff awash, but who's going to pick what actually wins is one part luck, another part impossible. Yeah. And in kind of using that as an example, you know, you tend to have this bubble, then you have the bubble burst, and then you have the ashes. And it's almost like the great using Microsoft and Amazon as examples. And there's other companies in that group too, that were around in the dot-com. It took like 10 years to, to come back. Um, but you know, great companies can emerge, but it sort of can take, um, a lot of time for investors to recognize that value again for a whole host of reasons. Um, but so and that's kind of getting us into, I think what some of the lessons are from this story and a lot of the other stories, a lot of the other funds that we, we mentioned at the beginning that, you know, investors could always learn from. So, and, um, let's just kind of work through these. So the first one is as investors, you know, you got to make sure you're trying your best, I think, to look at the evidence and validate things. And, you know, sometimes people can make outlandish statements or thoughts or things that are just so outside of like what is actually feasible. And at any other time, it might be like, oh, that kind of makes sense. But, you know, as investors, I think we want to be thinking thoughtfully about these in the reality, right? That's what the point of this is. And this gets mad at something we've talked about in our, pod, our separate podcast, Breaking News, which is like a lot of times when people hear politicians talk, they say, I like what I hear. But what they really mean is I like the way I'm hearing it. And, and you could do the same thing in investing. Like if Kathy Wood's out there talking about, and I don't know if 50% is the right number, but if she's talking about 50% GDP growth or something, you know, I could ask you, Matt, probably if, if I look at history and if I look at all the innovation bubbles that have existed, how many of those have produced 50% GDP growth? 
Depends on your political candidate, Jack. That's what yeah. <laughs> I think the answer is zero. Um, and so at it's least if I'm using zero. what <laughs> if I look and look at the outside view and say, all right, she's telling me we're going to get 50 percent GDP growth. Well, maybe I can look at history and say, have we ever seen 50 percent GDP growth? Or also, Justin, you know, if I asked you, like, if we look at all companies historically that have traded at 20 times sales and I built a portfolio of those, how well does that do? You'd think in most five or 10 year periods, you'd be pretty much down 90 percent. It's catastrophically bad, right? Without the percentages, the, the answer is no. catastrophically bad. And so, again, I can look at this and say, all right, someone's telling me these things I love about how the things are going to be different and this time is different and all that stuff. But by the same token, ARC's priced the sales of the entire fund, the, the, the flagship fund, got to 20 times sales at one point. Like, what are my, what are the odds if I look at history, even though I'm hearing about all these great things, like you talked about, Matt, the different areas they invest in, like, what are the odds I'm going to generate a positive return off 20 times sales of an entire fund? They're very, very low. And so I think that's the key here is, you know, no matter what you hear and no matter how compelling the person who says it to you is saying it, go back to evidence and say, what are the chances that this is actually true? I, I think that's really important in any kind of investing. Even hearing it from me about value investing or with anyone is to say, like, go back to the facts and don't get swayed by how compelling the speaker is. And check. One way you do that is you check the sources. And if you're not in a direct conversation with the person, you can try to look into them and try to see where they're coming from. Because again, I don't think I, I'm in the camp. I don't think Kathy Wood is an idiot by any extent of, you know, the terms. I think she's a thoughtful thinker. I may not agree with the conclusion that she comes to on how to express something, but I know I couldn't stick to it the way she and many of the shareholders could. And, and that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, but kind of like we talked about in our, year ahead episode that we just did a few weeks ago, like actually understanding the logic and I'm going to get this wrong, but it's something along the lines of she's like, we get to the 50% GDP growth over a multi-year period because in periods of like really rapid, when you introduce a new technology, like you introduce a rail car or steam or whatever else up to computers and whatever else, she's like, in those periods, you tend to get like three times or five times or six times or something like GDP growth for like a concentrated window around that thing. And it's one where it's like, okay, on one hand, maybe she's cherry picking the data sets that kind of rhyme with reality to get to this number. But on the other hand, that's a new way to think about a problem. And it's useful to understand, especially intelligent people's path of logic who are just using a pure hand-waving exercise. And she might be directionally correct, but exactly wrong. And what I mean by that well, is we might see GDP growth that is unlike any GDP growth we've seen or something. That's possible, but it might not be, you know, it's probably not going to be 50%. And so that, that's also important is, you know, she may get the innovation, she may get the fact that these are going to be, we're going to see massive innovation. We're going to see things we've never seen before, right? But that doesn't mean that like necessarily all the claims that go with that are correct. It makes me think of the, uh, the George Carlin thing, like the difference between deja vu and vuja day. Do you remember this? You're familiar with this bit? I'm not. So George Carlin says, you shouldn't be impressed with, like deja vu doesn't surprise him. He's like, so what? I see the same crap all the time. No big deal. What I really would be impressed with is Vuja Day, which is something that I have never seen before in my life. And I think you have to have that differentiation here. One of the points, Jack, on uh, sort of the valuation and that 20 times sales is like, you know, I believe the fund was always buying, for the most part, expensive unprofitable stocks. So they were, and yet, you know, 2017, 2018, 2019, 2020, you know, the fund just continued to go up. And so if you were kind of looking at that just from a valuation standpoint and saying, geez, these are expensive based on all traditional value measures, you know, you would have been out of that probably forever because you would have never, you know, and that, and that may not have from the investors. It's just, you know, the, the point I think is, is, you know, this valuation, trying to use valuation as a timing tool, especially in the short term, just doesn't work. Yeah, no, that, that's right. And you know, for periods, say less than five years, valuation is, is almost useless. Um, and to, to give you an example, like go back to 1995, you know, we could be like, let's short this internet bubble. This thing's getting out of control. Like we've got big returns here. Let's go ahead and short this thing. Like, but we got four more or five more years or whatever it was of huge returns. You would have been destroyed completely. So even, and, and going back to my 20 times sales thing, even though ARC's ETF got to 20 times sales, there's nothing to say it couldn't have gotten to 30 times sales. 
Like valuation tells you nothing about what's going to happen in the short term, and you have to survive the short term to exist in the long term. So that, that's just important to understand is like on both sides of it, like just because for us, like small cap value guys, just because, you know, stuff, everything's straight at five times, you know, uh, EPS or whatever, who cares? Like it doesn't tell me that next year I'm going to have a huge year. And so that, that's just a general lesson that I think applies to everything, you know, because people wanted to short Kathy Wood on valuation. And that went very badly for a long period of time before it went well. And you probably did not see the part where it went well if you did it too early. And I'm, I'm pretty sure we have Oswath Damodaran and several other people like on the record basically saying like, this is a really risky thing to bet against, at least to directly bet against this being wrong, because that can be really stubbornly pervasive when it's moving. One of the characteristics of growth stocks is, you know, if you buy a basket of expensive growth stocks, usually what happens to your point, Jack, is you, you know, don't, it doesn't end up well, but if it's, you know, depending on what's in that basket, you know, you might have some really big winners. And that's kind of a characteristic of passive investing. If I come down to the S&P 500, you know, a lot of the stocks might not make money. Maybe the S&P is not a great example, but any broad-based market index, you know, you have sort of the outlier positions, the ones, and those tend to be, by the way, they tend to be the Microsofts, they tend to be the Walmarts, they tend to be the Amazons and the NVIDIAs of the world that, you know, maybe started as small companies or small companies in the index had massive growth over a long period of time. And then they become sort of the dominant positions in the portfolio. And it also happens, I think, with a lot of growth portfolios. The question is, is if you're buying a basket of really expensive stocks because the ones that do really that well, are they going to offset the one, the big losing positions? I mean, it depends on the construction of the portfolio and everything like that. But I think that's just one of the characteristics of growth investing. It's not like on average growth stocks work. It's the handful of names that really work, really do well. Yeah, that's why growth doesn't work for quads like us. You know, growth needs like a guy who, or a woman who knows what they're doing, who can dig into these companies. And even that's very hard, but and figure it out because to your point, there were some great Netflix, buying Netflix at 10 times sales was a great idea. Although buying a basket of stocks at 10 times sales is not a good idea. You could have made a fortune buying Netflix at 10 times sales. So as long as you figure out what the right company is and they're going to grow at those kind of crazy rates, you know, buying a 10 times sales is a great idea. It's just the problem is the entire basket of 10 times sales is terrible. And you need someone who's very skilled to identify, they don't have to get it exactly right. Because if you have those types of companies in your portfolio, it can make up for a lot of bad companies in your portfolio, but you can't buy the whole basket. You, you've got to narrow it down at least enough where, you're, where those big winners are offsetting the bad positions inside the portfolio. And then stick to it all the way through and not abandon it when it blows up in your face in the first hour. Right. Like, I mean, how many 90% drawdowns has Amazon had? Um, at least two, I think. And so yeah. like, and during those 90% drawdowns, it wasn't obvious that Amazon was going to be what it is today. It was like, this thing's not going to make it. So like, are you the type of person who can sit there, you know, in that 90% drawdown when everybody's saying it's all over for Amazon and you can just keep holding it? Or also, are you the type of person who can make 10,000% on your money and still hold it? Like, those are both very, very hard things to do. Like you want to sell on the way up, you want to sell on the way down. Like the behavioral ride of these types of things is really, really tough. Which goes back again to... It's okay to own these things if you understand how you're going to stick to them, what would make you walk away from them. And then most importantly, and a huge part of, you know, my job is how do you size that thing? How do you make sure it's not going to kill you if it goes wrong, but you still get enough benefit for taking the risk if you have the right fortitude to put it on and keep it on? Yeah, that's kind of what I was thinking that, you know, one of the lessons, if you're going to invest in this, what I would consider, you know, more speculative stuff. If you get it right, to your point, Matt, I think this is kind of what you were saying, although I'm going a little bit against what Jack was saying maybe before, but you know, if you if you had plucked fifty thousand dollars in ARC early on and you see a double, I mean maybe, you know, what you think about is let me pull fifty thousand off, keep my initial investment in, and you're sort of taking profits as you go. Now you could look at that and be like, well, I'm leaving money on the table if it continues to go up, which it did. But on each like incremental, you know, I don't know, 50% gain or a hundred percent gain, you're, you're sort of in a disciplined way taking those profits. So eventually you're just playing with, you know, the quote unquote house money. You've gotten your initial investment back and then some, and then you can let the rest of it 
sort of ride if you want to stick with that type of strategy or vehicle or investment. Um, I mean, that's one consideration that people could think about. I still think one of my favorite analogies for all this, because it's all just portfolio theory at the end of the day. Once you've decided something like this is for you, and if you own something like this and then you start to work with somebody instead of them just saying it is or isn't for you and deciding it for you, it's you think of the thing as a garden, you think about a bunch of things that you've planted and they've grown and you have to have a harvesting strategy. If you don't have a harvesting strategy for your garden, everything just dies when it turns to winter. But if you have a thoughtful harvesting strategy, yeah, sometimes it's going to rain a lot and you're going to have too many cucumbers or, you know, the rabbits are going to come and like eat all your carrot or whatever, like things are going to happen. It's going to not go exactly as you planned. But when you have the approach of thinking of it as a garden, keeping it diversified, having a harvesting strategy that operates through the seasons, that's how you run a successful garden. (laughs) What you don't do is the disastrous approach of just like freaking out about everything, going with the whims and, um, you know, ripping everything out or starting all over again in the middle of the summer. That's great. I think that that's a great way to sort of end it on the, the, the garden, the, the, the garden analogy. I love it, Matt. Um, <laughs> well, wait, wait, wait. I, I have to this say is... this too. I do think, and, and I was thinking about this a lot because I had no song for this one, but um, Kathy's song by Paul Simon, the Simon and Garfunkel song, I think is is like the Kathy Wood anthem. And then let me just state my case before I take us out on uh thank you for my garden analogy. But but honestly, Kathy's song by Paul Simon, anybody who is a dedicated investor in a volatile asset class can appreciate Paul's love for Kathy in this song. Because and so you see, I have come to doubt all that I once held is true. I stand alone without beliefs. The only truth I know is you. If that's not high-risk investing, I don't know what is. The podcast would not be complete without a Matt Ziegler song reference. Always nails it. Awesome. Thank you guys for listening, and we will see you next time. Hi, guys. This is Justin again. Thanks so much for tuning into this episode. You can follow Jack on Twitter at at PracticalQuant. You can follow me on Twitter at at JJCarbono. And follow Matt on Twitter at at CultishCreative. If you found this discussion interesting and valuable, please subscribe in either iTunes or on YouTube or leave a review or a comment. Also, if you have any ideas for topics you'd like us to cover in the future, please email us at excessreturnspod at gmail.com. We would like this to be a listener-driven podcast and would appreciate any suggestions. Thank you.